Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and I have moved on from Paris. I moved through Luxembourg. Of course, I was there for Asteroid Day. It's actually now June 30th, which is Asteroid Day itself. Asteroid Day, if you don't know, is actually set to coincide with the anniversary of the Tunguska event, where an object from space laid waste to you know, hundreds, even thousands square kilometers of forest. So uh, Asteroid Day is all about kind of ra raising awareness of the potential hazard due to asteroids, but equally just bringing together a lot of people who like investigating asteroids and uh, talking about space technology, asteroid mining, anything asteroid related, to be honest. So the event was in Luxembourg and uh, I actually ended up doing a bunch of the, the hosting for it, which was a real first for me because I've never had the whole you know, person in my ear telling me to cut this interview short and things like that. I, I messed up the first one, I think, but by the end, I was I felt like I was a pro. But yeah, we got to meet lots and lots of cool people. They had the main astronauts there that are behind it. We had Ed Liu, Rusty Schweikert, and uh, Doran Dimitru uh, Prunario, who's a Romanian astronaut. And uh, also a lot of space scientists who work in asteroids. We had uh, Lynn Jones and, and um, yeah, oh, Jure Mario, Marco Jurek from um, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. I had a lot to say. Mark Boslow from Sandia who works on hydrodynamics of impacts. We had a lot to say. Um, and actually, yes, in a moment of starstruckedness, let's say, when I had to get my makeup done for the TV hosting, I sat down in the makeup room and across from me was internationally famous songstress, singer, um, West End superstar perhaps, Sarah Brightman. Now, you might know her from Phantom of the Opera and various other things, but when I was a six-year-old child, 1978, she was a singer on a fantastically cheesy disco number called I Lost My Heart to a Starship Trooper and you should Google it on YouTube because it is marvelous on so many levels. You know, obviously I was six year old at the time and I had a different perception of what good music was, but as a 46 year old, I realized that I was completely on the money and I love that tune still. I'm not ashamed. Obviously, another person that was there was Patrick Michel, and we spent a lot of time talking about the various missions he's directly involved in. Osiris Rex and Hayabusa right now are at asteroids and collecting samples. He had some fun stories about how when Osiris Rex discovered uh, debris being pushed off the surface of their asteroid Bennu, they, they uh, realized that they were required as part of the mission rules to notify NASA so that the NASA people would make a decision to pull the object, to pull the space probe back to a safe distance. And uh, so, of course, they dutifully made that phone call and the phone wasn't answered because the government was shut down at the time. And as a result, the, the Osiris Rex never moved back to a safe distance. And it proved that it was actually relatively safe, even though, yes, there are pieces of debris seen floating and falling off. Uh, there were also talk of another mission called Hera, which is part of the DART mission. Now, a couple of years ago, we were promoting the idea called uh, AIDA, I think. It was a dual mission. You would have DART, which would be an asteroid impact, or which would hit us an asteroid, and then another spacecraft would be there, which would observe this and see if the, the orbit changed. Now, since then, the observer spacecraft didn't get funded. So the replacement is called Hera. Now, the object in question is Didymus, and it will actually be its moon, Diddy Moon. And DART is actually going to be launched and is going to hit it. And the great thing is, because you have a moon around an object, we can measure the periodicity of it. And any small change to its velocity will be amplified by the periodic motion. So it'll be actually quite easy to tell if the asteroid has been deflected significantly. So I think the moon is about 140 meters, so it's about the size of the Great Pyramids. And we're going to hit it at several kilometers per second just with a kinetic impactor and show that you can in fact change the orbit of an asteroid. Here it will go up if it gets funded and it will continue to examine the objects and see how things have changed, look at the impact crater, various other things. 
So yeah, uh, if you want to get, if you want to see the public side of that, you can go to asteroiddata.org and you can see the full live stream and the various other supporting videos that we have made. You can see me messing up interviews and sitting on panels talking about how uh, video game technology is actually revolutionizing our ability to actually catalog and find asteroids in the solar system. And uh, also discussions of art and visualizations and various other things. So yeah, asteroidday.org, go there, sign up, check it out. Elsewhere, we have had in the last few days some other um, you know, missions that are worth talking about, missions I'm very interested in. Firstly, you've probably heard by now that there is the, the Dragonfly spacecraft was the one that was approved. There were two potential finalists in NASA's competition. One was to get a sample from a comet. The other was to send a nuclear-powered flying robot to Titan. And I can tell right now that you know which one got picked because nuclear-powered flying robot on Titan. All those words together are pretty awesome. And we, I mean, all those words individually are pretty awesome. Together, they are really amazing. And I'm very excited to have Dragonfly fly to Titan, and you drop off this, ro this flying vehicle, which will period up, will land, it'll do science, and it'll take off, you know, maybe a month later and fly to a new location and continue to do stuff. It will have spectrometers to analyze the atmosphere and the local uh, soil, the local t surface. It'll have seismometers to investigate, uh, you know, whether there are quakes on Titan, cameras. Like, it, we've sent one spacecraft to Titan. It was called Huygens, and it was a very, very small lander. It had a camera on it which had something like 20 kilopixels, which is staggeringly low resolution by today's standards. But... But yeah, we're, uh, we're hoping that in about eight years there will be a spacecraft launching to carry this to Titan and then another seven years later. I'm going to be like 60 when this gets here and yeah, that's a sobering thought, but I'm still going to be super excited when it gets there. Another mission that got approved, which I'm really interested in, is called the Comet Interceptor. So we've obviously sent spacecraft to comets in the past, but these have all been periodic comets. And when Oumuamua flew through the solar system a couple of years ago, scientists were obviously would have loved to send a spacecraft around it, but we didn't have enough warning and you didn't have a spacecraft sitting out there. So the idea with Comet Interceptor is to have a spacecraft that deploys to the L2 point, the Lagrange point on the far side of the moon, and sits there waiting for a suitable long period object to come through the solar system. So they're going to look at this and, uh, you know, they're going to look for objects and if they find one, they will head off towards it. And they'll have a couple of other supporting spacecraft because they want to do a fly pass, but they want to get multiple angles on it so that they actually can develop, determine proper topology. Long period comets, new fresh comets, are going to be way more active than, say, Comet 67P that was visited by Rosetta. So the Comet Interceptor is actually going to be a secondary payload on the Ariel mission, which is going to be an exoplanet hunter. And it's going to go to the L2 uh, waypoint, you know, Lagrange point on its own. So this is going to basically be a cheap mission that hitches a ride out there. And, you know, I've actually asked the lead investigator what they're planning to use for propulsion, because the way I see it, they could either have an ion thruster to get the maximum delta V, or they could exploit the fact that they're sitting at the L2 point and use a couple of gravity assists. They can you know, push themselves away, swing past the moon, swing down low over the Earth, and then firing their engines there, they can maximize their uh, delta V, basically by exploiting the Oberth effect. And that's a very interesting solution. It was actually used by uh, ISEE-3, which was the, uh, another spacecraft that used a double gravity assist to fly out and investigate Comet Halley. It wasn't supposed to investigate Halley, but smart guidance people said, you know, we could send this to Halley. So yeah, that's my current update, what I'm doing currently in Belgium, in case you hadn't guessed. Uh, we will be moving onwards to Amsterdam and elsewhere over the next few days, and I will continue to make videos. Until then, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe, and check out Asteroid Day, of course. Mm -hmm.